No, floor is your, Mikkel. All right, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, I hope it's fine if I sit down because then it's easier for me to show you something on the screen with mouse. But um, first of all, uh, sec second of all, I uh, hope you're all doing fine because of all that's going outside the observatory. Um, my presentation will be about the work I have been doing for the last few months in Capazeta. And it has been some code development. And this uh, development has been trying to solve the problem as follows. Uh, namely, uh, let's imagine we would like to process the satellite data for some large area, let's say Villandi country. Uh, we have some uh, raster image available for this region that uh, has been coming from previous stages. And then we want to make some statistical analysis for this uh, processed uh, raster data. Uh, stati statistical analysis in the sense that we have some quite big set of parcels and we want to calculate some statistics for each of those parcels. Uh, in Estonia, the amount of those parcels is in the order of uh, 10 to 5, but uh, in principle, the same principle I'm going to show you works quite well for, for in any uh, size of uh, images. Uh, so the amount of parcels for the whole Estonia, uh, if, if, if you would like to uh, cover the whole Estonia, the amount of parcels in Estonia is in the order of 10 to 5, or is it more? 10 to 5, like the total number of, total number of, of parcels. parcels. 100,000. 100, yes, so 10 to 5. Ten, ten to five what? Uh, so number of parcels for the whole Estonia, right? Okay, and uh, the, the raster image that describes this uh, whole region can be in the order of uh, many hundreds of gigabytes. So each of those uh, pixels on this zoomed in image sort of corresponds to four times four area. Uh, so you can imagine how many of those pixels are for the whole Estonia and how large is the raster image. So you can't just uh, uh, load this whole raster image into your computer and do the uh, stati statistical analysis there. So you have to do it in a smart way by avoiding uh, the load of whole image into your computer at the same time, uh, at once. Uh, in principle, the whole process of analysis could be divided into big, uh, three big steps. First of all, it's important to determine which pixels actually are we interested in of. So we have some uh, geometry that corresponds to some parcel. And now we need to determine the, uh, each pixel that uh, uh, lays behind this geometry. The next step is to uh, actually read uh, the uh, raster image. So each pixel has some, some measured or calculated data. So each pixel needs to be read into a computer. And after this, uh, the st statistics could be calculated for those pixels. So minimum, maximum, average, median, uh, standard deviation, and several other things that, that might be uh, interest. And in our case, in Capacita, uh, all this process must be done several times because we are interested of time series. So we do this whole cycle for several, several times for each time step we, we want. Uh, so far, all those three steps have been done in PostgreSQL database, which in general is a good tool because it contains all the SQL database features. And also it has uh, 
geographic infosystem support. So you can really uh, do very fancy geographic uh, magic there. However, it also has drawbacks. First of all, it's a database, so indexing must be done there, which takes time. Second, in order for Post PostgreSQL to operate, all the raster data must be imported there beforehand, which is quite slow, as it turns out. And, and third uh, drawback this system had was that, uh, well, in principle, you can control what's exactly going on there, but, well, you can't really go very, very deep in this. So you have quite poor control over what's exactly going on there. For that reason, we decided to uh, rewrite this whole process for C++ language, which is, first of all, fast and fast, fast uh, language, uh, allows doing calculations in a quite efficient manner. And second, it's object-oriented, so it, it is really possible to make modular code uh, for this so that uh, new features could be added later on quite easily. And, and also for C++, there are available a, a lot of uh, different libraries that help to do all kinds of magic without uh, the need to write uh, all the magic by yourself. And also, you know, C++ language is already quite old in the computer science sense. And so far it has uh, survived, also developed, and so therefore it's quite good reason to think that it will be in the future as well. So it's quite future-proof option. Um, so let's uh, step on the first step on this uh, whole process and uh, discuss how, how the pixels could be determined that lie under the, some geometry. Um, the first idea would be to just loop through all the pixels uh, in the raster image and then develop some function that determines whether this particular pixel is inside the geometry or not. And, and by this you can make some map uh, to later on uh, do the calculation. It turns out that writing such function is quite straightforward. So the algorithm for this is in principle uh, in, in a way is that uh, uh, if you draw some random line from the point of interest and this random line crosses the geometry boundaries for even times, then the point is outside the geometry and if this line crosses the uh, geometry for odd times, it is inside the boundary, uh, inside the geometry. However, this method is uh, justified for the cases we are dealing with random points. Uh, with with uh, raster images, however, the points are not very random. They are very strictly ordered in a, as a regular grid. So a little bit better uh, method could be used. And this better method uh, could be called the polygon fill algorithm, which uh, sort of has an idea that we are not going through each pixel of the image, but each line of the image. And uh, for each line, we determine the uh, which uh, intersections are on this line. So we go from left to right and find all the intersections this line has with the geometry, and from there we can really determine the pixels that, uh, that lay inside the geometry. The cool thing with this algorithm is that it, it naturally takes also in, into account the possible holes in the geometry. So really, you don't need to do any specific um, operation for the holes, they are really naturally taken into account. And uh, those are the two main advantages of this polygon fill algorithm. First of all, you don't need to loop through all the pixels, but it's 
uh, enough if you loop through all the lines. So this means that the whole algorithm is much, much more efficient. And second, uh, it takes naturally into account the holes, which, which, which is uh, not the case for the point in polygon al algorithm. For there, you have to treat the outer polygon and inner polygon differently. So it adds extra layer of, of uh, computational cost. Now about the second part of uh, optimizing the workflow, reading the actual raster image. What could be done there? Major uh, way of uh, ordering the data in, in images is to order it as lines. So each pixel is uh, first uh, written to left top corner and then uh, the writing goes from left to right from top to bottom way. Another way is to order pixels in a tiled way. Uh, so first you divide the big raster image into squares and then you start filling those squares line by line. Uh, the lined uh, data ordering is supported by most of the uh, image types. So PNG, uh, DIM, that is the standard uh, file format for snap, for example. But uh, tiled uh, data layout is, is not supported so widely. Uh, one of the uh, formats that supports it is TIFF files. So that's the reason why we decided to use this one. And why is this tiled uh, data ordering good? It's good because it allows uh, reducing the amount of pixels that really need to be read from the raster image. So we can really uh, just uh, read those gray areas and avoid reading the uh, white ones. So saving a lot of uh, reads from the hard drive. And it's important because in uh, high performance computing, it's, it's very well known that any kind of data input output should be minimized especially data input output that comes from the hard drive because this is the slowest. And if we now manage to organize things in a way that about half of the image we really don't need to read in, then we save a lot of time. For example, the test I, I carried out in one uh, thousand square kilometer area that contained uh, about uh, 3,600 parcels the uh, ratio between the number of tiles I read in between the uh, over the number of tiles in the whole image was 0.4. So more than half of the pixels I ever never read in, which is, which is uh, the thing that is almost impossible to achieve if, you, if the data is ordered in line wise. In that way, most probably you have to read the whole image several times into the memory. Um, while developing this, I was really surprised that this system works really fine even when the tiles go really small, so 16 by 16 pixels. So the performance really keeps gaining. This is a really non-trivial result because any data query from, from a hard drive uh, or, or any data query consists of uh, two, two uh, parts. So uh, first of all, uh, the time goes first for the latency. So telling to the hard drive that, hey, I, I would like to get some data. And, and second part comes from the transfer time itself. The, the latency uh, is, is constant while the transfer time sort of linearly depends on the amount of data you want to transfer. And uh, to speed up the things, it's uh, reasonable to read as much data 
by one choir as possible, because in that ways you can really minimize this latency part and make sure that the transferring part dominates. However, uh, by, by reducing the size of the tile, really the latency part should start dominating, but uh, it wasn't very noticeable. And I think the, the main reason for this was that all the tests I was doing on uh, solid state drives, which, which are well known to have very small latencies. And second reason is that, uh, you know, this uh, diff image where uh, I, I was reading in the uh, pixel data, it uh, contained four, uh, nine channels. So e each pixel had uh, four, four nine channels, which means that the amount of data that is read in by one tile is, you know, all those ch channels are read in at once. So this little bit increases the amount of data I read uh, each time. So tiled uh, uh, TIFF image helps to reduce the time that goes for raster image reading. And now the final part, the statistics part. So how, what, what can be done to optimize this part? First of all is parallelization. So let's uh, imagine we have quite simple operation. We want to add two vectors and store them as a third vector. So quite standard thing to do while, while doing statistics. By just adding one line to this uh, for loop, we can uh, invoke open MP uh, parallelization that sort of just distributes all this uh, loop for the all cores that are available in the system. And if your system, for example, has uh, uh, four CPUs, in principle, this loop becomes four times faster. Uh, why, why in principle, in practice, well, uh, what happens with this pragma line uh, system generates some additional trades and making those trades also takes time. And, and second one, uh, this, this uh, for loop here, it operates on the same memory space. So uh, uh, although the processes, processors are different, the memory might still be the same. So even if all the processors are making some data queries, they, they might be just uh, waiting for the data to come. So this little bit decreases the amount of uh, win we can get from here. But in principle, just one additional line and code goes significantly faster. Things are a little bit more complicated if uh, we don't want to store the result in a vector, but in one scalar. In that case, we have to take care that uh, well, the different processors don't uh, disturb each other. So we, we, we have to split this uh, C parameter between the cores, but it can be, again, quite easily done by just adding one uh, element to this pragma line. So this is about parallelization. Second thing that can be done is, so to say, vectorization. What does it mean? In normal operation, uh, what computer does, if we want to add two vectors, it just takes uh, elements of those vectors and stores them, just one by one. First element, second element, third element. However, it's also possible to organize things in a way that not one uh, addition is done by one uh, CPU cycle, but eight of them. So eight uh, numbers are taken uh, by one CPU cycle, eight one, uh, numbers are taken by second CPU cycle, and third one stores the result. So in principle, we just can get th things going uh, eight times faster. Such a pros, uh, approach is called the uh, SIMD, so it stands for single instruction, multiple data. And, uh, and uh, in uh, Intel uh, processors, how to realize this SIMD mode is as follows. 
uh, again, let's imagine uh, we want to uh, make this multiply and add operation. So we first multiply two vectors and then add a third one to them and store the result on a fourth vector. In a scalar way of doing it is, is to write such uh, C code. So again, you just loop through uh, eight numbers and do the operation in a standard way. However, to do it in a simd way or to, to process the data as vectors, you can write such code. So, well, I know it a little bit seems cryptic, but uh, in principle, this is just one function that you need to call. And, uh, and after this, uh, exactly the same thing is done. So first of all, you save this looping. So instead of doing eight, eight steps, you just do one step. And second thing, you can do really two operations at the same time uh, with a single command. First of all, you can do multiplication and, and, and also addition for this. It's all done in a uh, one cycle. Mm. As, as one could conclude for, from this uh, cryptic uh, language, it is, uh, well, in principle, the, the system is easy, but the, the main problem there is that it's very system dependent. So uh, not all the uh, CPUs uh, allow such function to be called. In order for the uh, uh, compiler to compile this code here, uh, first of all, you need to have uh, Intel uh, CPU, and second one, it, it has to support, so to say, AVX commands, uh, which is true for the new computers, but is not true for the older ones. And also, uh, the amount of uh, numbers that could be processed in that way is is also different. So the newest computers allow uh, processing 16 floats with a single command. The older ones allow only four floats to be processed in that way. But uh, yeah, uh, such vector processing really helps to speed up things a lot. Maybe one could uh, imagine that, uh, hey, but what about if I have some different command, uh, like, uh, if I don't want to make this uh, multiply and add, but I would like to perform just adding. Well, uh, in principle, what you need to do, you just have to replace this function here. And Intel has a long list of different options for this. So I just show you one, uh, the, this page that uh, sort of lists all the different functions. So. As you can see, there is a huge list for this. And all those functions uh, help to do some, some, some operation. Of course, you can't do all the possible math here, but the, mo the most common ones are present here and you just have to find the proper one that does the addition or separate uh, multiplication or some some uh, bit manipulation things. So yeah, you just have to pick the proper one from here. As a final slide, now the uh, results that uh, I got with all those optimizations. So uh, previously, uh, the PostgreSQL based system uh, took more than 1,000 seconds to process area under 1,500 square kilometers that contained approximately 2,000 parcels. So for PostgreSQL, it took about more than 1,000 seconds, while for the code that I was developing, it took only a little bit more than two seconds. So as you can see, almost three orders of magnitude speed uh, Im improvement. Well, of course, uh, uh, 
the, the amount of data, uh, the amount of time that uh, PostgreSQL was, was spending, uh, well, it was divided for different operations. For example, uh, raster image import is included in this thousand seconds, which is quite big part of it. Also the indexing and, uh, and, and stuff. But still, the overall time that needs for this is, is that big. However, for, for the code, you can really see that the, the, so to say, functional part, so the calculating statistics, that takes about one third of the total time. So the rest of it, so the reading to the image and, and importing and outputting the data, it also takes time. But the statistics really occupies the significant part for of, of, of this whole time, which means that, well, uh, the code is really doing what, what you want it to do, not doing some, some things that it, 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 it wants to do. Okay, but uh, by this, uh, I have finished, and if you have questions, feel free to ask. Thank you. No questions online. No questions online, yes. Uh, Leah, I hope that you managed to unmute the people. Uh, yes, uh, everybody have uh, muted themselves if they are uh, muted. Right. But number of people uh, have been joining as listeners, and I'm not sure if they can uh, switch on the microphone at all. Oh, by, by the way, if if uh, I think you didn't mention before, but uh, this system also has the chat part so you can also write the question there if you wish can i ask the first first question okay uh, is post press well quintana said something that it is not optimal yes but if one would optimize the post press well then what would be the time then yeah exactly so so uh, as, as, as Kaupa mentioned, this PostgreSQL, this thousand seconds here is, you know, not absolute, no, uh, absolute number. You can really fine tune the, or, or just tune the SQL so that it really does the things faster. Uh, uh, I don't have the exact number, but uh, the order of magnitude that you can win by this is, is just one. So you can remove the zero but in that way, so okay. on the, on, in the best yeah. case. Still it would be like 50 times faster. But uh, yeah, this is, this is the best you can do. Yes, okay. There seems to be a written question. Right, so, uh, so those uh, optimizations, uh, most probably, uh, so such kind of optimization, yes, uh, definitely does exist for uh, AMD CPUs as well, because this uh, SIMD uh, paradigm, it's, it's quite a universal one. And uh, it, it's quite widely uh, used, but of course you can't use the same commands for this as, as I showed, because, well, they're, they're AMD and, uh, you and you have to do something else for this. Okay, okay. Well, uh, I knew that the AVX is a sort of Intel's invention, but... Yeah, it's Intel's invention, but this uh, support for ARM32 is coming from the little lab. But so Intel announces it, mm -hmm. and in one or two years' time, then ARM32 said, no, our new model also supports it again. All right. Uh, by the way, I, Lea, uh, I hope uh, Kaupa is well uh, hearable to you as well. Uh, yes, uh, quite sufficiently. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, Joel has also. Okay, uh, Joel is also asking something. Uh, one 
so first So, uh, so why doesn't this uh, point in polygon doesn't work for holes? Uh, okay, so wh what you need to do differently here is that, uh, let's say you have hole. Uh, uh, so hole like this. So first you have to check that the point is, is, is not in the hole and if the point is in the hole, uh, apparently the point is not in the hole polygon anymore. So this, this additional step you need to do, you first have to check that the point is not in the hole and then you can start checking whether it is in the uh, outer polygon. I hope it's, it answers your question, Joel. Uh, if you count the number uh, of uh, uh, crossings of the polygon, then uh, if you start inside the hole and start moving, then you still get uh, two crossings, so uh, even number. So I don't see why it shouldn't work. Uh, well, yes, in that uh, in, th in that case, yes, but uh, just um, well, okay. Well, uh, this this particular uh, claim c comes from the uh, exact algorithm I found uh, how to, how to realize this this check. So this uh, code itself looks like this. So I go out from here. It is one of those additional slides, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, all right, I hope you see it. Uh, and this uh, additional uh, uh, slide just shows the code, and here you don't have this uh, exact counting how many times you cross the boundary, but uh, just you do this uh, dummy looping, and uh, that's that's why you have to do it a little bit. Uh, the, the, the algorithm itself doesn't uh, return you how many crossings you have with the polygon, but it just uh, uh, returns you whether the point is inside or outside. Okay. There is one more, some more return questions. So uh, did I uh, did we check any other databases? Uh, well, I think well I personally didn't, but I think in Capacetta we also haven't tried any other. Th the reason is that uh, why we use PostgreSQL at all is this uh, GIS support. This is really unique property of all the other databases available. And uh, like, like so much as we have looked around, probably done it and tried to find it, but Postgres seems to be like the standard. So, so yeah, it is. So it is standard tool, and uh, it's a standard freeware platform. Like yeah, and and, and, you in, and in principle, there is nothing wrong with the PostgreSQL. Yeah. It, it does its job really well. Just uh, the problem arises if you really start uh, looking for the performance. So then you really want to minimize this, uh, you know, unnecessary operations. So you really have to customize your stuff. And that's exactly what we have been doing. So we, we have already de developed some system, so we know what we want to do. And now we just want to squeeze uh, the maximum performance, how to do it the most efficient way. That's the reason why we didn't, uh, for example, use some MATLAB or, or some, you know, some other universal tools. We really wanted to make very specific uh, tool that does very specific thing. Right. 
Thank you, Anu, for kind words. Uh, is there any more questions, uh, either told um, or written? Uh, yes, the next uh, next week should be next seminar uh, about uh, statistics in forestry. And I hope to send the invitation again uh, soon. And uh, at least uh, like uh, the seminar seems to work with this software. We are now planning to stick to this uh, kind of software for the next seminar as well. Uh, by the way, for the next seminar, uh, I, I predict that the uh, next seminar will still be under the state of emergency. So <laughs> this, this time, Kaupa kindly came to listen to me in personal, but uh, for the next time, I suggest that someone else also comes here. We have here. a five-meter distance between us. Everything. Yeah, yeah, well, we have distance, and this is all fine, but uh, you know, it's a little bit more fun to talk if, if you have some person sitting next to you not just talking to the computer screen. Yeah. Well, I can volunteer. I'm pretty sure next mm -hmm. week I'm also in, in observatory. Yes, it's uh, next week. Uh, probably the presenter will not be in the rubber. All right. This is this makes things more complicated. Yeah. But this definitely, uh, we have now much more people who usually would not uh, manage to come to participate in a uh, seminar in Taravara. So now this emergency situation has actually improved our access to um, listeners. <laughs> yes, yes, that's true. But I I think, uh, un unless somebody um, has very quick question, I think we can uh, finish uh, this seminar and uh, let's meet virtually uh, next week. All right. Thanks for, all, for coming. <laughs>